Welcome to Warriors for Christ podcast. I'm Sam, and this is the uh, uh, last episode I'm doing for the today. I'm by myself again, and we're going to finish it off, the series on temptation, with a final four-part on do you pass the test. Now, we've already covered the part one. We laid a background for temptation and explaining the basis of it, primarily focusing on James chapter one. Uh, the went in and did part two, which was uh, why does God test or tempt? And it's to know the condition of the heart. And then the third one is don't test God or tempt God. Now, in the, the first one, we kind of laid the background of, one, why do we have temptations? Kind of like, why does God test? Well, to know what's in the heart. If you're passing the test, do you pass the test, which we're going to look at today, then you know that you're, um, you have a good heart and you're overcoming. Uh, that's the person that's blessed that we covered. If you aren't and you're failing the test or you're testing or tempting God that we covered in part three, then that would imply there's a problem. Uh, you don't have a new heart, a new spirit. You need to still come to God. And we looked at the passages. If you're failing the test, remember, God tests you to find out what's in you, not to test you to sin, not to test you to evil. God doesn't do that. But if you're being tested or tempted to evil, that would imply that the sin still dwells in your heart. You're being tested by your own desires because of sin that's still there. And, and we hit a lot of that in the covering James chapter 13 through 15 in the first part episode. So with that, why don't we open up in prayer? And we'll get started. Father, I thank you that we have your word. Father, I thank you that we can rejoice and count it joy when we have these tests and trials or temptations if we're overcoming. It's the proof of it's a proof of our faith. You test us to know what the result is and where we stand with you. I pray that as we read your word, you will open people's eyes and ears, and Father, reinforce your truth deep into their heart that they may know where they stand with you. Do they pass the test? Do they have a proof of faith? As we're going to look in your word and let your word explain it to us. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so to start, I want to back up to the Old Testament. I want to cover one passage there, and then we'll spend most of our time in the New Testament. You know, in Genesis chapter 4, God had a conversation with Cain. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? Well, Cain wasn't doing so well. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 5 through 7, it says, But for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So Cain became angry, and his countenance fell. Verse 6, Then Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now we know that Cain did not master it. Matter of fact, sin was master over him. Now we covered earlier in overcoming sin in the part two chapter how you can overcome sin. You have to be spiritually baptized and crucified. And we covered what happens and what God defines what it is. We went on and looked at what it means to be free. We went in and discussed the difference between the flesh versus the spirit and the war of the flesh, which is not supposed to be happening in your body. And this all kind of ties in and reinforces and is consistent with God's scripture in looking specifically at temptation. If you haven't listened to those episodes, I encourage you because God's word does not con contradict. It's harmonious when you look at the full chapter, the full book, and you compare it again to other passages in scripture, taking it in the context of what God has established when you read that book. So let's go back to James. Now, we covered a lot of James in the first part episode. Today, we're going to cover some of the, some, a few of the similar passages because we're looking at the proof of a faith. And there's two places 
in the Bible where it uses the word uh, for the proof of faith, the noun dokumion, which is a proof or tested faith, one that has been tested and found to pass the test. So in James chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 2 through 4, it says, an imperative command, count it or consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various temptations. Uh, that word is the noun, pyragamos, Strong's number 3986, it is the noun to test or to tempt or a trial. So we're to be counting it joy when we have these trials. Do you count it a joy when you have these trials? You might find that a strange question. I've heard people preach this in churches where they say, well, I don't count it a joy. Uh, it's not comfortable. It's, it's not fun when you fail and this and that. Well, there's a problem. The reason why they don't count it joy is because they're failing. You see, verse 3, it says, knowing that the proof of your faith is producing endurance. Verse 4, an endurance imperative command must be having its perfect result so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. Well, that's if you have a proof of faith. That's if endurance is having its perfect result. Now, that proof of faith, again, that's that word, Strong's Concordance number 1384 or 1383. Some people, their Bible will say um, the testing of your faith. Well, just understand, it's a noun. It's a faith that has been tested and to past, a tested faith or a proof of a faith, that which passes the testing. Do you pass the temptations? You see, it's a litmus test. This isn't something that God's trying to deceive you or trick you. No, he tempts or tests you to know what's in the heart, whether or not you fail or pass. It's the proof of whether or not you have the new heart and the new spirit, a proof of a faith that can save, not a faith that cannot. So the question is, do you have that proof of faith? Now, if you don't, well, there's good news for you. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, if you're lacking the true wisdom of God, it says, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But there's a condition. Verse 6, he must ask in faith without doubting. The one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That man ought not to expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Now, the other place it uses some similar language is in Ephesians chapter 4. It talks about the one who's still an infant. It contrasts that with the perfect man who's come to the same fullness and measure and stature of Christ in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. And so, as a result, in verse 14, he's no longer to be an infant who is tossed by waves and driven about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery and scheming of men. Well, that past person never came to the truth, the infant. And as we did a study on infants in the series on the book of Galatians, we know that the infant doesn't have the Holy Spirit of God. They're still seeking. And that's why they're deceived. That's why they're driven by waves. That's why they're bounced around and blown about by the wind and cannot find truth because they're being deceived by all of man's teachings. But we don't want to be that person. That's the person that obviously they haven't come to the true faith. They don't have the spirit of a new heart. They cannot overcome the testing. So the other place where this word is used, and we covered much more of the book of James in the first part episode to really ground you in the, the, the totality really of temptation and how it works and how that stands with God. If you're failing the temptation, it's because you're the man who's not blessed, who does not have a proof of faith, and you're being led into sin when you fail your test by your own lust that still lives within you because the sin hasn't been put to death. If you don't understand that, listen to the series we did on overcoming sin. And God's word will make it clear. Now, turning over to 1 Peter. The other place, the only other place this word is used is in 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read here uh, verse 6 through verse 9. In this you greatly rejoice, 
even though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various temptations or trials. It's the word paragmos, Strong's number 3986. It's the noun, temptation, or a trial. It's the same thing. Verse 7, so that the proof of your faith, there's that word again, Strong's number 1383, it's a noun, dokumion, which is a proof, the tested faith, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, might be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The tested by fire, uh, that word is 1381. It's a verb. The verb is to prove, to test, to approve. It's dokamazo. It's also associated with that word there, the 1383, which is the noun. You see, somebody who has a proof of faith is someone who has a proof or a tested. Uh, when it's tested by fire, it's found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here, when you look at 1 Peter, it's very consistent with James. They're greatly rejoicing. Remember in James chapter 1, verse 2, count it all joy when you encounter these temptations. Here it says rejoice when you're distressed by these temptations. And the second uh, element of that is, is the same in both cases. If you have a proof of faith, because if you have a proof of faith, and James it says it's producing endurance, and endurance must be having its perfect result. Here it says the proof of your faith, which then it, it caveats that's more precious than gold. It defines a proof of faith as something that, when tested by fire, it's found a result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as you keep going, the, the beauty of that is, if, if you go through all that, you obtain as the outcome of the, your faith the salvation of your soul in verse 9. That's the faith we want to have, a faith that results in the salvation of our soul. We need to make sure we have this proof of faith, a tested faith. Now, later when you look at 1 Peter and chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, it again talks about this testing. It's going to use the word paragmos, which is Strong's 3986, which is temptation or testing. It's the same word. And so chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing or your uh, tempting as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so at the revelation of his glory, you might rejoice with exaltation. And again, it's because you're overcoming. You're suffering as Christ suffered. Now, we know the true grace of God stand firm in it. We covered it. It also points to 1 Peter chapter 2, and it talks about we're to be suffering as Christ which is commit no sin, have no deceit in your mouth. Uh, it continues to talk about the person who in chapter 4 earlier, verse 1 and 2, same chapter here, therefore since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but the, for the will of God. So it gets back to how do we have this proof of faith? Are we overcoming? When faced with suffering, temptations, and trials, when it's most inconvenient, is the result that is produced one that's overcoming. Not because of our strength. We could never do it. Believe me, before God changed my heart, even I tried as hard as I could and I continued to fail and stumble because I didn't have power. No matter how much I willed and I desired and I longed for God, my will could not overcome the sin and the death that dwelled in my heart until God put it to death and removed it when he gave me the new heart and the new spirit. Praise God. And again, we've done episodes on the new heart and the new spirit. Listen to those and God will open your mind to truth. Uh, 
that can save your soul. But as you continue to look at this, when he talks about this suffering that we're to have, uh, he again, he says, well, you got to make sure uh, in verse 15 that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, a evildoer, a troublesome meddler. No, no, you can't be suffering with sin. Verse 16, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's to not be ashamed, but is glory, glorify God in this name. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin with a household of God. If it begins with us first, then what will become the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it's with difficulty that the righteous is being saved, then what will become of the godless man? What will become of the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is good. The question is, are you suffering in accordance with the will of God? Or are you still doing evil? Do you overcome? Do you suffer as Christ? As we read earlier, the same purpose. God's really clear in his word. The question is, instead of fighting against the word, do we embrace it? Do we accept what God has to say about us? I'll be honest, for me, it was a very difficult confrontation when God first confronted me. It took me a year. I just could not accept it. It was contrary to everything I'd been taught my entire life about the faith and the grace of God because I was not taught the true faith and the true grace of God. I was taught a distorted grace, a distorted faith, a distorted love. The ways of God were made crooked and not pure in the teachings that I was brought up. The common grace and faith that's being discussed and proclaimed across the world and many churches today. You have to stand firm on the word of God and let God's word instruct you, or you will never come to the truth. In 2 Corinthians, uh, continuing to look at do we have this proof of faith? Do we pass the test? The Corinthians was a church that struggled. They struggled very mightily. We did an episode on that about the Corinthian church. Uh, we did looked at both books, and we looked at Hindsight's 2020. We started with 2 Corinthians. We went backwards. And they had a lot of problems. They had many people who were still infants, had not received the Spirit of God. They were still fleshly. They had not become spiritual. There are some that were spiritual. But let's look at the instruction that Paul gives at the end in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. Now, the back, backdrop leading up to this point is they continued to sin and hadn't repented. So, actually, in verse 2 of chapter 13, Paul says, I previously said when present the second time and now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to the rest, if I come again, I will not spare anyone. And then he goes and he kind of rebukes them. He gives them an imperative command in verse 5 through verse 6. Test yourself. Test yourself. Now, that word is Strong's number 3985. It's the verb, to tempt or to test. He's commanding you to tempt yourself or to test. Like I said, God tempts us or tests us to find out if we are of the genuine faith, to find out what's in our heart. Paul here, consistent, is commanding to tempt yourself, to test yourself, to see if you're even in the faith. Now, he's writing this to a church, but as you know, if you've listened to the episode we did on the 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Hindsight's 2020, you'll understand all this because we went through the two books in detail and exposed many of the false teaching and the lies that are being taught out there. Most people identify with the man of the Corinthian church who's condemned, the man who cannot overcome, the man who struggles. They think that just because it's a church and they're called a Christian, that therefore they're a true Christian, not realizing that in those episode, in that episode we cover, it talks about people who have a faith, and Paul even says you have a faith that cannot save. You must understand the difference and stop picking and choosing and plucking. Now, you probably aren't doing that, but you don't realize that the leaders that you listen to do, and most of them do. So you must let God teach you and get into the Word of God and appeal to Him to open your eyes to his truth. So he says, test yourself. See if you're in the faith. Prove yourselves. That second word is Strong's number 1381. It's dokamazo. 
to prove, to test, to approve. It's a verb. You're commanded. Prove yourself. Or do you recognize this? Do you not recognize this about yourself? That Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test. Or you find out that you're unapproved. You don't pass. He says, but I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Again, there's a command. Do you find yourself that you pass the test, that you're approved? Or do you realize that you don't have a proof of faith and you failed? The issue was sin. Listen to the episode. Next, backing up, I'm actually going to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we covered this a little bit in the episode that we did, the third one, about uh, you know, our, that we are not to test God. And we looked at the Israel, how they tested God. And it didn't go well for them, and it was for our example. Well, at the end of that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, he then tells us, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands, imperative command, take heed that he does not fall. Now, you see, most of the people that this was written to, they thought they stood. They thought they had, they thought they had a confidence in God, a belief and a faith that could save we covered in the last episode in the part three, the danger and the warnings of that, how the people didn't. It was written for our example. We looked at the book of Hebrews, also here the full chapter 10. But look at this end here. You, are you somebody who says, yes, I'm a Christian. I know I'm going to stand. Well, listen, it's a command to take heed. You who think that you stand, take heed that you do not fall. Now, why would God say that? What's the danger? How could somebody who calls himself a Christian, who has faith in God, how could they be in danger of falling? Well, verse 13, the very next verse. No temptation. Strong's number 3986. Again, the noun. No temptation. Did you catch that? Not some. Not some. None. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful. See, this doesn't depend on you or me. It's God who is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted. That's the verb. Perazzo, 3985, Strong's number 3985. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you have power. But with the temptation, again, Pyrogmos, Strong's number 3986, God will provide you a way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Does that sound like persevering, overcoming, enduring, the proof of faith that we talked about? That's why we're counting it joy. So the question is, do you fall or do you stand? Do you overcome? You see, the promise is there is not a single temptation that you will face that God has not already already provided a way for you to stand up, for you to have power, to you to overcome it, to you to endure it. Now, that's only for those who have the power of God. Well, first, all the lusts that lead, that the people that are tempted by their own lust that leads to sin and their death that we covered in episode 1, or the part 1, in James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. It's kind of like the old man and discussed in Romans chapter 7, verse 13 to 25 that we covered in the Overcoming Sin series, the war of the flesh that can't overcome. That's because the sin still dwells in them. They cannot overcome. They cannot endure. They fail repeatedly. Every day they fail. Most people fail more than they realize because they don't understand that what defiles them is even the thought that's in their heart. Just the thought, Jesus says, you still have a defiled heart. You're guilty. You're guilty of murder. You're guilty of adultery. Just the thought. Now how well do you think you stand with your temptation, knowing that it's even in your thought? 
that you're failing because it lives in you. The sin hasn't been removed. Now, that's the case for many, many people before they receive a new heart and a new spirit. They just aren't being taught the truth. They cannot endure. I want to continue to look on. I want to look at this verb, this proving, to prove or to be approved of this proof of a faith, this tested faith. The verbs used several of the times. I want to look at those passages here uh, in the New Testament. And let's go over to Romans chapter 1 and 2. Now, we covered some of this when uh, we looked at, are you a spiritual sacrifice? Uh, We covered that as a separate episode. We also covered it when we went through the book of Romans, looking at chapter 12 and chapter 13. But in chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, here it says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you're proving the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. We're proving the will of God. That, that's the verb, 1381, dokamazo. Proving the will of God, consistent with, do we have this proof of faith? Well, have we been renewed in the spirit of our mind? Are we living our lives as a holy and living sacrifice, which are our spiritual service of worship? Well, you can't do that unless you've been filled with all the deity of God. Go listen to those episodes that we talked about. Look at all the word of God, the probably many words of God that you don't even know exist in the Bible. You're to be proving the will of God in your life. All that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Well, that sounds like the man of James chapter 1. The proof of your faith is producing endurance. Endurance must be having its perfect result. So you'll be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. The man that we covered just now in the promise of of, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 through 13, about no temptation. With all temptation, God is going to give, we're going to have power to be able to stand up and endure everything. Now, you can argue with me. The question is, you're really arguing with God, not me. This is his word. If you're doubting or you're arguing, it's most likely because you do not have the power of God. You have not been strengthened by his spirit in the inner man, being filled to all the fullness of the deity of God in you, which we cover in the episode of Ephesians chapter 2 through 5 and many other episodes. In Galatians, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, this word again, to prove, to test, uh, to approve by testing, this verb, in Galatians, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, it says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Uh, That's the verb, pierazo, Strong's number 3985. But it's the command is to the one who's spiritual. We're to restore people. But we need to be careful, not be arrogant. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Remember, we've received nothing. It's all by the grace of God that we can overcome. Verse 4, but each one must prove his own work. And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not regard to another. You see, if we have a proof of faith, we can have confidence. We can have confidence between ourselves and God. We can boast from the standpoint with, with that confidence that we have, knowing that God gave it to us. It's really a boasting in God, between us and God. It has nothing to do with others, but because we've proved our work. We're overcoming. We're able to restore other people. We aren't the ones that are getting caught in these things. Now, as you keep reading in chapter 6, there's a warning and a command, because many some of the people were being deceived. Go listen to the whole episode we did in the book of Galatians. And you'll understand. Verse 7, it's an imperative command to stop being deceived. It's a negative imperative present. God is not mocked. 
For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Well, what is he talking about sowing? Well, it really comes down to, are you overcoming the temptations? Verse 8, the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Therefore, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now, sowing to the Spirit, we just covered previously, not today, but earlier, and earlier in this book, in chapter 5, right before chapter 6, it talked about people that were to be living by the Spirit if you belong to Christ, if you've been crucified, if the flesh has been crucified with all of its passions and desires. It says, if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In verse 16, those who walk by the Spirit will not carry out any desire of the flesh. The question really comes down to, is the Spirit of God in you? Have you been crucified with Christ? We covered a, we did a really good episode on that, looking at overcoming sin, the part two, uh, spiritually crucified and baptized. Looking over to Ephesians, another use of the word. Do you have a proof of faith? Do you prove yourself? Do you pass the test? In Ephesians chapter 5, I want to look at verse 6 through verse 10. It says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. That's how God thinks. Anything contrary to God's word, he says it's empty, it's vain. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. You were formerly in darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Imperative command, you're to be walking as children of light. The fruit of light consists of all goodness, all righteousness and truth, proving what is pleasing to the Lord. Do you prove what is pleasing to the Lord? Does your proof of faith, is it demonstrated? Are you overcoming the temptations or are you failing? Do you still struggle with your former darkness? Do you still struggle with those things? As those who the wrath comes upon the sons of disobedience. Remember, don't be deceived. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, it says, And you were being dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. It's the devil who is the prince of power of the air, his spirit. The question is, have you received a new spirit? Have you received a new heart? Are you now those things that you used to do, they no longer exist in your life? Well, if you're still doing them, how could they be former? They're still alive. I would challenge whether or not you've been spiritually crucified or baptized. Go listen to that episode. Verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived. It's a past life in the desires of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Until you can come to a point to be proving what the will of God is, proving what is pleasing, the fruit of life, all goodness, righteousness, and truth, that which is of light, no longer as those who are in darkness, but walking in light, well, then you're in trouble. The wrath of God is still upon you. Do not be deceived, and do not let anyone deceive you. And Philippians, another use of the word about this proving, uh, dokamazo. In chapter 1, verse 1 through 11, it says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Not everybody has the true knowledge and discernment. Verse 10, So that you are proving the things that are excellent. That's right. We're to be proving these things. What things? The things that are excellent. In order to be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Well, how did that happen? Verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Were you ever filled? Were you ever filled? Do you know what that means? Looking at dokamos, uh, which is the adjective, which is something that has been tested or approved. Uh, We find that three places we're going to look at, going back to 2 Corinthians 13, 7. Now, we are you already have some background in this because we just covered the passage where he commanded them to tempt or to test themselves to see if they're even of the faith. Now here, 
as you keep reading that, he says in verse 7, he says, Now we pray to God that you do no evil, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you might do what is right, even though we may appear to be disqualified or fail the test, because they were being accused of failing and not being true servants of God. But the whole point is, is that we are approved. And he's praying that they do no evil, because the problem is they still struggled with it. Anything contrary to the will of God is evil. Like the man that we covered in the War of the Flesh, in the part four episode of Overcoming Sin, that's all that person does. He does evil. And we learn going through scripture that that man will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He's still condemned and wretched. Second Timothy chapter 2.15. Other places where this word is used. The adjective dokomazo. Or I'm sorry, the adjective dokomos, which is 1384. Something that's been tested, approved. And Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, it says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, that which has been tested and approved, as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. This person accurately handles the word of truth. Now, the problem is people were wrangling about words, um, but it can't lead to someone's salvation, but only to the ruin of those people, as discussed in verse 14. As a matter of fact, in verse 16, it says, Avoid this worldly and empty chatter, for it only leads to further ungodliness. In verse 19, it tells us what the firm foundation of God is. It says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from all wickedness. As you keep reading, it talks about that that person is a sanctified, holy vessel for honor because they've been cleansed from all wickedness. Contrast to that with those at the end of the verse, that those who are in opposition to this message, verse 25, if perhaps God might grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they might come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do the devil's will. Back to James, where we started. In James chapter 1, verse 12, it talks about the man that's blessed. Blessed is the man who perseveres under temptation. Once, for once he has been approved, which is dokamos, that, appro- that one has, has been tested and found to be approved, he will receive the crown of life. Well, he's the one that's persevere, persevering under temptation. He's the one that's blessed. He's the one that will be approved. He's the one that will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Curious about, you might say, oh, but I do love God. Well, listen to the episode we did on love the greatest commandment and love do you walk in it. And you'll find out if you still struggle with sin and have sin in your life, then God would differ what he would beg to differ and say that you do not love him. Because to love your neighbor as yourself is no longer sin against him. Go listen to the Ed episode, listen to the word of God, and God will make it very clear to you in his word. Uh, so with that, I want to finish off with three other passages. Um, again, talking about uh, this overcoming and having a proof. You know, when you look at going back to Ephesians and Ephesians chapter 6, there's a reason why we put on the full armor of God. And those who have been born again, spiritually baptized, have put on the full armor of God. But some of the Ephesians hadn't. So as you go through and read that, you'll understand. We did a full episode, chapter by chapter, three different episodes covering the book of Ephesians uh, through that. You can see it in the title. It lists the book in a chapter number. But in chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, actually I'm going to read 10 to 13. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So again, in verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist 
in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. We aren't to be failing at the temptations. We're be overcoming. We're able to stand firm if you've done everything. You see, when you go through and you look at it, have you girded yourself with the loins of truth? Well, until you come to the truth and understand the truth, you can't receive the Spirit of God or the gift of righteousness, which he says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Those who've girded their loins in truth have put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's what it does. Your feet are now shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace because you now know the true gospel that you can tell it to people. You've taken up the shield of faith, which will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows. Until you have a true faith, you cannot extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Again, the helmet of salvation is for those who are walking in the salvation of God, who have the Spirit of God. Some of these same words are used of Christ in the prophecies of Isaiah about him uh, putting on the armor of God, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. We're to do the same thing, having been filled with the same fullness of God, the same Spirit that we've covered in the other episodes. In Acts... Chapter 20, Paul referring to how he's overcoming, again, the trials as the evidence, as we covered in James and Peter, the proof of our faith. In Acts chapter 20, he talks about temptations that he's facing from persecutions of people. In chapter 20, starting in verse 18, and he says, And when he had come to him, he said to him, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you um, the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with temptations which came upon me through the plot of the Jews. Again, temptations, testing, or trials. It's all the same word. It's the noun, paragamos, Strong's number 3986. So even though he had that, verse 20, I did, how, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And behold, I'm now bound in spirit and on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. Verse 24, but I do not consider my life on account as dear to myself so that I may finish or complete my race and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul, facing death, facing all these temptations, did not detour him. He continued demonstrating the proof of his faith as he continued to overcome. And we'll end with Second Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 through 9. And if God rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them, referring to living among Sodom and Gomorrah, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day, By their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Father, I thank you that through your word we can come to the knowledge of the truth. We can receive the new heart and the new spirit to receive and have a true faith, a proof of a faith as demonstrated by the power of God in us, sin having been put to get, put to death sin having been removed and cleansed from our heart, now walking in the Spirit, proving the will of God, doing all the things that are holy and righteous, persevering, overcoming the temptations that we face and the trials, not by our strength, but by the strength and the power of God within us. It's a proof of our faith. It's a proof of our faith as discussed in James, as discussed in 1 Peter. A proof and a promise that we can now overcome all temptations through you, O God. We can persevere. Father, I pray that more people will find the true salvation of God, the true power, and receive of the new heart and the new spirit to be set free and be able to overcome the temptation and to pass the test. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.